This is Carlo Koliakovo, and you're listening to Vibe 105. Vibe Talks. Vibe Talks. More than just music. Hey, everybody. This is Giancarlo Alino and Aaron Zareski reporting for Vibe 105 with a Sports Vibe Talks segment where we're happy to be joined by our guest. He's making his return to the Vibe 105 airwaves. He is the co-host of First Up on TSN 1050. He's a former NHLer, Carlo Koliakovo. How are you doing, Carlo? What's up, boys? I'm doing great, man. The sun is out. Uh... It's a beautiful Thursday morning, and I'm happy to be on here with you guys. Oh, that's great. Uh, Carlo, we're going to start off there with the expansion draft. We're fresh off that. Uh, a lot of big names were out there. Vladimir Tarasenko, Carey Price, uh, even Landis Gog in Colorado. Were you surprised at the decisions that uh, Seattle made here? Um, uh, yes and no. I mean, I was surprised in the sense because I believe there was some impact players there that they could have selected that have made them more of a competitive team to start next season. But I'm also not surprised either because when you look at their final roster, I don't think it's complete. Uh, They have just under $30 million left in cap space. And um, I know there was their, it was their job and their priority to fill out the roster, but at least now in any type of negotiation moving forward, either with a free agent or or through a trade, uh, you can actually, um, you know, see what you know the players that they have on their roster that either they can uh, dangle as trade bait or as players coming in can see what this roster will look like. Um, I do love what they did on defense. Uh, I really like the acquisitions they made, including the two free agent signings that they were able to announce yesterday with uh, Oleksiak and um, Adam Larson. I think that creates a formidable pair. You add Mark Giordano and Vince Dunn to that, that's a pretty good solid four defense that – you start your franchise with and even some of the pieces that they've added around that with like a Carson Soucy or Curtis McDermott or a Hayden Flurry. Uh, that's some great depth to add to that group. And then up front, you know, Yanni Gord was a, was a surprise pickup for me. I mean, the fact that uh, Tampa Bay left him exposed, you saw the impact that he was able to create uh, in two Stanley cup wins for the Tampa Bay lightning. Mason Appleton's, I think a good young player, Jared McCann, who may believe has got a quick, uh, sniff at in a short time here. Um, great, some promise. And Brandon Tanev in, in Pittsburgh too, a really, really solid role player. So, um, you know, with that much cap space, you, you got to kind of think that cap space has become the most important asset that you could have uh, to build your team for next year because of a flat cap. And I think Seattle's put themselves in a good position to continue to add to this group. So, um, you know, I, again, it's, it's a process. If you compare it to what Vegas did, the, the lineups look pretty similar and you saw the success they were able to have in their first year. And um, I expect that Seattle will have somewhat of, uh, this, I don't want to say the same success, but um, somewhat of a, a fortunate success because it just because of the division that they're playing in the Pacific division where, you know, really after Vegas and Edmonton, who I consider, you know, shoe ins to be playoff teams, they're competing against other teams in that division that, that will allow them a chance to at least complete, compete for a playoff spot next year. And um, you mentioned uh, Jared McCann, who the Leafs acquired in a trade from Pittsburgh a few days prior to this expansion draft. Um, was that a strategy designed from Leafs GM Kyle Dubas for Seattle to take Jared McCann? I mean, it sure seems like it. Um, I don't quite understand um, the, the strategy behind it because ultimately you knew going into the expansion draft, every team knew they were going to lose a good player in their lineup. And if you look at some of the decisions they need to make with some of their other free agents, including Zach Hyman and Freddie Anderson and Zach Bogosian uh, to fill out the rest of their roster, you know, you would think that, you know, losing a guy like Kerfoot or Dermott uh, would be something that you could expect. I, I know people that know Jared McCann a lot better than I do were, really excited about the Maple Leafs adding that type of player because of the upside that he creates coming into a lineup, especially playing behind, you know, Sidney Crosby last year and Evgeny Malkin and having a very successful year uh, production wise. So, um, but, you know, in saying that, you know, to, to bring in that move to protect an Alex Kerfoot, which is a guy that had a really good playoffs last year. And I think the organization feels really good about because of his versatility to play both the wing and center it's a move that clearly worked out for them. Um, but, you know, going into the offseason, you kind of thought that Kerfoot was going to be a guy that was they were going to move on from regardless because it was going to free up the cap space that they needed to make the other additions that they need 
to round out the rest of this roster, like you know somebody to compliment Jack Campbell and that, maybe to give more money to keep Zach Hyman to stay. Now potentially, uh, you know, you could be losing Zach Hyman. You're probably going to lose Freddie Anderson. You might even still trade Alex Kerfoot because you'd think that as a third line center ice bin, maybe you could find a, a cheaper option, um, you know, to, to fill that role. But Kyle Dubas and, and lease management are going to have a lot of tough and interesting decisions to make here in the next coming week. Uh, now with the draft coming up where you expect a lot of player movement uh, to happen and even at free agency where, you know, there's a quite a list of, of big names that are out there that can definitely change the outlook of a, of, of a team's, uh, you know, projections or at least the team's, um, you know, um, upside for next season. Yeah, Bill, for sure. And and with the Maple Leafs, right, they had another good regular season, but then they had another disappointing uh, playoff performance. Um, just talking about that disappointing playoff performance, uh, could it possibly be a psychological issue amongst the core group where their mental toughness isn't really where it should be regarding handling adversity in the playoffs? I mean, it's, you're, you're pretty safe to, to assume that. I mean, this is the same group that has been, um, you know, trusted to uh, take this team to the next level over the last three seasons. You talk about since adding John Tavares, you know, where the expectations have gone with this group and with this core. And, you know, you're seeing the same story written every year. Great regular season, get to the playoff, can't get the job done and can't get the job, the job done in, in similar fashion. I think this year was a little bit different because, um, you know, they won the division. They were, you know, put themselves in a position to have, you know, a, 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 I wouldn't say a weaker opponent, but a, an opponent that you are clearly better and statistically. I mean, Montreal finished with the 18th best record in the NHL. So clearly they were favored in that matchup and rightfully so with a 3-1 lead gives yourself a great opportunity to close it out. And just the way they played in the next three games where they didn't even hold a lead in any of those three games. I know in game five and game six, they found um, some energy to, in, in comeback fashion and to ultimately lose in overtime. But just the effort that you saw in game seven, which is the third year in a row where you had a winner take all game and your big players just didn't show up to play in that game or didn't meet their level of expectations, I think has to um, create a level of concern for this team, you know, this fan base, and even more importantly, this management, because, you know, you, your your job and management is to construct a team that is going to bring you success. And when you put trust in the players to do that and they show you the same result year after year, if I'm a general manager, um, you know, that's the three strike rule. If you're asking me, you know, three strikes, you're out. And clearly something I think bigger needs to be evaluated here when you're talking about assessing the core of this group and whether they're capable of getting the job done. So, I, you know, everything you hear is that they still believe in this group. Um, that's a hard thing for me to digest and probably a hard thing for a lot of Maple Leafs fans to digest. But, you know, you got to let this thing play out. Um, you know, I think Kyle Dubas deserves a lot of credit for the, the, the job and the maneuvering he did even last season uh, with minimal amount of cap space by bringing in, you know, solid veteran guys that help this team have a, an amazing regular season. Well, now it's, you know, even you can go with the trade deadline. I thought he, he was the, the, the general manager that did the best job at the trade deadline, considering the players that they brought in with the limited cap space and some of the creative maneuvering that they were able to, to do to give themselves a, a formidable lineup to compete in the playoffs. And now you can't judge or, or predict what injuries are, are going to happen. You know, losing John Tavares hurt, you know, not having a 100% Nick Felino healthy uh, definitely hurt. Um, but uh, clearly there has to be some evaluating and Kyle Dubas has his work cut out for him. With uh, Carlo Koliakovo here on Vibe 105 Sports 5 Talk segment. I'm John Carlolino here with Aaron Zaretsky. Uh, and Carlo, just on this topic of the Leafs now, Kyle Dubas has to make some tough decisions in this offseason. And uh, one of the big criticisms that he's had in the past has been contract negotiations that maybe he gave too much money to guys like Marner and Matthews and he caved in, didn't really try to bring them down. And now you look at a situation with Zach Hyman where they make a sign and trade where he's going to Edmonton uh, $5 million a year. Do you think like Kyle Dubas put his foot down on the wrong type of player? Like maybe he should have been more firm uh, in the salary contract negotiations with uh, some of the big three? I think everybody will agree to the fact that uh, those negotiations didn't necessarily go 
uh, in the Maple Leafs' favor because, uh, you know, you, I, I, don't, I don't sit here and sort of reflect on the John Tavares signing because John Tavares was a, a different signing. It was a UFA signing uh, that he would have gotten on any other team that he signed with. And when you have a player that with, uh, with that uh, profile that's, that wants to come play for you, find a way to make it happen. And the Maple Leafs had the salary structure to make it happen. I think the, the only problem with making that happen is that you didn't have those other guys locked up before you did it. And, you know, you played with fire and you basically allowed these players to bet on themselves, which they did. And they forced the hand on the Maple Leafs to pay them and to pay them at market value, which was the John Tavares contract with this team. And so they, they got themselves stuck in a predicament where they had to overpay for some guys. And maybe they did in their sense, they didn't overpay because that was what the, the market that they viewed them at considering you know, where they projected the salary cap to go and be at, at this point in 2021. And let's be honest, with no COVID, I think they'd be sitting pretty, really pretty right now with 10 extra million dollars to work with because that's where the salary cap was projected to go. So now you have to adjust on the fly. Um, you know, you, you can sit here and speculate all you want, but at the end of the day, this is what you're dealt with. And, um, you know, I, I think, you know, if, if the contracts were done before John Tavares, probably they could have got a savings of five or six million dollars between those three players, but it didn't happen. Now it's created a tough conundrum for them uh, because you're, you're having players that you want to be around that are being presumed to be more valuable in other places because they can afford to pay those guys what, you know, the, the contracts that they believe that they've earned and deserved to get to this point. So, um, that's the difficulty that you, that, that you have when, when you commit yourself to this type of formula and think that it's going to work and you're thinking to have success with it. And that's the tough part is that as much as you believe it can work, it hasn't provided the success. So not only does it create a difficulty with you building around it, but you know, for, for trying to recruit other guys to come play here, to, to make your team more competitive and, and help you get over, over the, the hump of losing in the playoffs makes that even more difficult uh, when constructing that. So uh, this, this is providing a, a quite the challenge for the Maple Leafs, and that's why you know, the, the lack of success or the, the way they went out this year in the playoffs stings even more because really if you, if you evaluate the path that they had to get to where Montreal got to, um, you know, who's to say they're ever going to have that type of path available to them again? Because, you know, I don't think it takes a genius to figure out what division they're going back into next year where they have the two, the back-to-back Stanley Cup champion playing it in the Tampa Bay Lightning, the Boston Bruins. You have a, a young and improving uh, Florida Panthers team that finished with the fourth-best record last year. Montreal just made the Stanley Cup finals. You have to think that they're going to uh, make some moves as well, too. And you've got a young and hungry Ottawa Senators team that is going to be vying to be a playoff team next year. So the path... And, and the job doesn't get any easier next year, especially when you're hoping to improve off of last year, but you're losing players that were part of that um, you know, success last year too. So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. I'm curious. Um, I, if, if I were the GM, I'd be looking to make impactful changes because uh, I just think that there's been too much uh, of, I wouldn't say a country club, but you know maybe uh, – you know, there hasn't been enough of uh, accountability here uh, for this group and some of their lack of success uh, with their expectations. And even following on that, like uh, I like what you brought up there about uh, accountability on the team. Uh, there's been like an outcry, like as soon as uh, the Leafs were eliminated of Mitch Marner, how he hasn't scored in the playoffs, big games, and uh, maybe people are saying they should trade him. But like going on uh, the other side of things, like if they trade Mitch Marner, what is the service going to look like for John Tavares and Austin Matthews, who won a Rocker Richard with Marner on his wing? So do you think people maybe are jumping to conclusions on Mitch Marner? Do you think that's warranted based on how he played? Yeah, it's a big time jump to conclusion. It's a massive overreaction too. I can understand the frustrations when digesting the numbers and, and the frustrations around the, the lack of productivity in the playoffs, but um, you know, Mitch Marner type of players uh, don't come around very often. This is a guy that plays the wing that can drive his own line. And clearly you see the players that he plays with um, have very impactful seasons. I mean, John Tavares scored the most amount of goals in a season playing alongside Mitch Marner. Uh, and he was probably begging and pleading last year to get reunited with him at some point during his early season, season struggles. 
And just look at the potential of what Austin Matthews could be playing alongside Mitch Marner. Uh, won the Rocket Richard last year. Has the potential to be a consistent 50-goal scorer if he plays alongside Mitch Marner. And that's, that's the sort of fine line you walk here. You could say, yeah, trade Mitch Marner. He's not worth the money. He's overpaid and stuff like that. But let's be honest. In, 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 he, he, he's a guy that has, a, I wouldn't say the potential. I think he's a guy that's going to be a, a consistent 90-plus point guy in the NHL playing alongside Austin Matthews. So if, if, if you are, and this is where people need to educate themselves around this situation, if you are to trade him, one, are you getting full max potential value back in return? I don't think you are. Um, you know, when you talk about uh, what he brings to, you know, th this group and uh, the, the production level to this team, it's not – how often can you go out there and find 90-plus point guys a year? I mean, that's top five scoring in, every, in, in the season every year. And, you know, I can't sit here and say other than guys like McDavid and Dreisaitl who've done it the last two years that, you know, guys consistently uh, can start the season and tell themselves they're going to be 90-point guys because you see what happens year after year. Um, there's always guys that come up out of, um, you know, out of the blue and there's always guys that struggle. So, uh, for Marner, he's a guy that I think consist can consistently do it because of his creativity level and obviously his skill set and, um, his hockey IQ. So instead of finding or, or looking for solutions with your best players, I think you've got to look for solutions within um, you know, within your organization, it starts with the drafting and developing of your younger players, because in a cap world, you've got to be leaning on those guys more than ever. So you've got to start hitting on some of these draft picks. Uh, maybe Nick Robertson is a guy that can come in, um, you know, s s almost the same type of player. I don't think as skilled as Mitch Marner, but smaller in stature, can score goals, can skate, uh, can create offense. Um, and you just, you find the plug and play guys that can play around those guys that will hopefully, you know, find you levels of success. That's, that's the pit, the way Pittsburgh has done it. They found two guys with Crosby and Malkin and year after year, they're plugging in guys either from their minor league system or from guys in free agency or through trade that come in and find immediate success and, and find the same level of production that they're expected playing with those guys. Yeah, no doubt for sure. Um, with, uh, this is Aaron Zareski and Carolino with, uh, TS and hockey analyst and former Maple Leaf Carl Kolakovu here on Vibe 105. Um, it's been 15 seasons since Pat Quinn's last year as head coach of the Toronto Maple Leafs. Um, what was it like playing for him? That's a loaded question for me because uh, when I played for Pat Quinn, he was a guy that loved playing his older guys. He, you know, he, he admired the veterans in his group and veteran related lineups and I was a young 19 year old playing for him. So, um, you know, it, it, it's not the same trend as you see in today's game where, you know, younger players hold so much value to the success of your organization because guys come in more ready uh, than ever before. Um, I loved Pat Quinn as a person. Um, I thought he was the most, one of the most respectable guys in the game and obviously coming into the game and coming into that team, you kind of knew that he was going to, you know, a Hall of Fame coach. Um, you know, to say what was it like playing for him, I didn't play much for him. So I wouldn't really know what it was like to play for him other than the fact that he didn't really play me much oh. when I was around there. So, uh, but, you know, there, there's no animosity towards that. Uh, I understood the situation I was in. I was a young 19-year-old playing on, on a very veteran-laden team in the, in the Toronto Maple Leafs where the next oldest guy was 28 years old. So um, it shouldn't really come to a shock and surprise to think that, or at least to, to say that, you know, Pat Quinn wasn't one of my favorite coaches. One, I can't honestly sit here and say that because I did enjoy my time with him, meeting him, getting to play for him, everything about him. I know the players that, that were on that team that played for him loved playing for him because he was just one of those guys that, you know, had a system in place and trust his guys to play it. He wasn't really a guy that, barked at too many players he showed a lot of respect to his older players if anything he spent more time on the bench yelling at the referees <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah i mean god bless his soul the big irishman um clearly uh he made a name for himself uh, both playing the game and, and coaching the game and uh it's sad to, to, to think that he's not with us anymore but uh nothing but great things to say about pat Quinn. very nice and like and, like, did you ever find him intimidating when he would chew his green gum? 
<laughs> no, the only time I found him intimidating was in back-to-back games. He took a puck to the face. And he had two black eyes staring at you, talking at you um, after that. So um, pretty comedic. Yeah, he was a famous gum chewer, but uh, never once that I think he was ever intimidating. And, and uh, Carlo, just on that, uh, just a lot of people reflecting uh, nowadays, uh, this time of year, the draft comes up, uh, free agency. 20 years ago, you were uh, drafted by the Toronto Maple Leafs. Uh, can you just take us through what that whole experience was like? And when you heard your name called that you were drafted by your hometown team, just uh, what was the reaction in your family? It's crazy to think that you said 20 years ago. Wow, how yeah. time flies. It's uh you know, I, excuse me, I just sent out a, a memory on Twitter, I think a couple of weeks ago, about that moment and what it meant to me. It was the start of my career. Uh, you know, it's a start of a dream come true because not only do you get drafted to play in the NHL, but you get drafted by, you know, your hometown boyhood team that you, that you marveled uh, your whole life. And uh, to this day, it still seems surreal that I actually got to live that moment because as grateful as I am, um, you know, the fact that I was able to live through that, uh, I, I wouldn't be here today in the position that I'm in, you know, being, um, uh, a personality on, on, on sports radio here in Toronto on TSN 1050, uh, as a TSN hockey analyst, as a Maple Leaf alumni. I mean, I could go on and on about the things that playing for the Maple Leafs and getting drafted for the Maple Leafs has, uh, created for my lifetime. Uh, but that moment, um, I went from being a kid that just enjoyed playing hockey to a celebrity overnight. Uh, from the time my moment was called where I was surrounded by 30 of my family members in Sunrise, Florida, uh, where the Maple Leafs select my name and then watching the video afterwards about my parents crying in the stands and showing tears of joy for me and uh, our family, um, you know, will, will never be something that I can easily be that can easily be replaced with all the memories that I still hope to create in my life. Um, you know, a, an unbelievable moment, and I'm happy I got to share it with my family, and I'm um, grateful that that well, it's tough the last two years at least with the draft because it's you didn't really see those players that were drafted share those same moments of being in an arena and the celebration and the roar once your name gets announced, but um. You know, the only thing, the only regret that I have about my time in Toronto was I never got to experience playing in the playoffs in this city. And um, I know growing up, playoff fever, watching those Sundin and Gilmore eras, uh, even to now, you know, watching them in the playoffs and cheering on for their success. It's been 18 years since they've last experienced any type of success in the playoffs. So the starve and the hunger is there for Leaf fans and even just former Leafs like myself who really have a strong tie to the organization. Um, even though I'm not playing for them. So uh, the memory will last forever as long as I'm here working in Toronto, living in Toronto, and still acting as a proud member of, of the Toronto Maple Leafs alumni. Uh, but uh, clearly uh, a moment that helped set the stage for what my career was going to be and what it is right now. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for sharing that, Carlo. Uh, Aaron, any uh, other questions? Um, yeah, so uh, Carlo, so with the Summer Olympics coming up, um, if there's – if you could participate in any summer Olympic event, which one would it be? Um, two. Uh, I would love to participate in the volleyball. I used to be a huge volleyball player in uh, in high school. Love the sport, love the game, um, and I really enjoy watching uh, those games when they're on the TV. But I think golf would be the other one. Uh, to, to win an Olympic medal playing golf in the Summer Olympics would be an incredible um um, accomplishment for sure. Oh, nice. Cause even like, though my game is not quite there, <laughs> but <laughs> if I had a chance to do it, that's something that I would love to do. Very nice. And like, for me, like I always been interested in the shot put event uh, and like seeing how those guys, you know, the athletes, right. Just turn around and just, you know, try and push the ball, see how far they can go. Hmm. Yeah, don't don't count me in for any of the track events because I hate running. So, <laughs> <laughs> Is there a, speaking of golf, like uh, we, our past guest there, uh, your colleague, James Duffy, he got a hole in one uh, a couple weeks ago. Who uh, has bastard, a bragging eh? rights? What a lucky bastard. <laughs> who has a bragging uh, rights in golf at TSN? Oh, uh, he definitely has the bragging rights. Uh, it's funny you mentioned that because of the timing of the question. 
uh, a week ago, we have a yearly match. It's me and my producer, Aaron Korolnik versus James Duffy and my boss at TSN, Jeff McDonald. And we've, we've been playing for the last four years and I, I haven't had a chance to, to taste victory against James. They've, they've owned us now, uh, three wins and a tie, um, in our golf matchup. So you're talking about who has the upper hand. James just got a hole in one. I don't have one of those yet. I hope to one day, uh, accomplish that feat, but, uh, Man, I hate giving James credit, but he deserves all the credit here, man. He's he's the guy that uh, definitely has the upper hand on the all the chirps, all the trash talk, and now even all the awards. That's great to hear. Uh, well, Carlo, uh, before we wrap up here and let you go, how can our listeners follow you on social media and uh, stay up to date with everything you're doing at TSN on First Up? Yeah, so I'm on Twitter at Carlo Koliakovo. I'm on Instagram at Carlo.Koliakovo. Um you can follow us uh, at uh, on the podcast uh, first up uh, with Landsberg and Koliakovo on TSN 1050. Uh, you can uh, subscribe to the podcast. You can listen live on the TSN app. Uh, we are live on the air uh, every Monday to Friday from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. Eastern time. And um, you know, I, the odd time I do. Uh, uh, TSN hockey games too. So if you want to catch me on the tube, I'll be available on there. I'll also be available on, on uh, free agent frenzy for TSN. I will be doing the, the broadcast live in studios from there, from there too. So uh, give me a follow. I'm pretty sure you won't be disappointed. I highly recommend that. Uh, Carlo, like to thank you for sharing your time and coming on here and talking all things hockey with us and sharing some memories and wish you all the best. Thanks boys. Appreciate it. Talk to you soon. And now back to your vibe, Vibe 105.